Hello, good evening, everyone. This is Dari on World Streams Radio. Thank you to our listeners from all around the world for joining us. To learn more about World Streams Radio, visit our website, worldstreams.org. You can also find us now on Facebook at facebook.com slash worldstreams. Tonight we're going to be discussing the political situation that has been ongoing in the Middle East and North Africa. Our guest tonight is Stephen Zunes. Dr. Stephen Zunes is a professor of politics and international studies at the University of San Francisco, where he chairs the program in Middle Eastern Studies. He also serves as a senior policy analyst for the Foreign Policy in Focus project of the Institute for Policy Studies, and he is an associate editor of Peace Review and chair of the Academic Advisory Committee for the International Center on Nonviolent Conflict. Hello, Saeed. Hello and welcome, Professor Zunes. It's an honor and pleasure to have you with us tonight. Great to be with you. Good evening to you, Dari, and good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us, to all, to all our listeners from around the world. And good, good evening to you, Professor Zunes. Thank you for being with us tonight. Uh, we've, we've, heard, uh, we've heard President Obama's speech tonight. Uh, what do you make of it, and why did you think that he wanted to address the nation about Libya? Well, there are a lot of questions uh, from uh, left, right, and center about the advisability of this mission. I think there's a, an understandable suspicion after uh, the Iraq debacle and the seeming uh, quagmire Afghanistan about the United States getting into yet another Middle East war. But the president you know, tried to make a, a, a strong case that this is different, that it's uh, uh, limited to an air campaign uh, limited to a humanitarian mission, that we had authorizations from the United Nations, that we were working with our NATO allies, so this is not a uh, unilateral you know, kind of thing, and, and, and basically try to say this is more like Bosnia than it is like Iraq. So what is the fine line here between uh, what is referred to as the moral imperative and U.S. vital interests? Um, well, it, it, it's... it's um, <clears throat> It's a tricky one. I mean, I think uh, on the one hand, I, I, Obama tried to appeal to American idealism and the, and the idea that just these sort of things shouldn't go on on period and period and uh, and, and, and appealing to a sense of our, our humanitarian concern, but also that if you do have uh, massacres and, and oppression uh, like this, it could end up uh, you know, spreading and and uh, spreading throughout the region. A region, of course, where we have we do have a vital interest. Uh, of course, there's been uh, repression on the scale that Gaddafi is engaged in and threatened uh, before, sometimes committed by allies of the United States, and we didn't seem to be too eager to intervene in those cases. So, you know, there are, that does raise questions of double standards and the like, but uh, he, he did believe that at least given the limited scope of the mission that uh, he was hoping most Americans would understand why he agreed to participate. <laughs> There are some uh, there are some rumors talking. Actually, I've read a few uh, that uh, we that the U.S. doesn't know who's who are these freedom fighters in Libya, and I, I read somewhere else also uh, earlier that someone was saying that two out of five people in Libya are Al Qaeda. Uh, what who who knows what's going on in there? Well, I think the al-Qaeda uh, presence has been you know, greatly exaggerated, but I, I do think there's a, you, ha you have an overall good point that uh, when the movement started off about a little over a month ago, uh, it was a nonviolent, grassroots, pro-democracy movement uh, comparable to what we've seen in Egypt and Tunisia and Yemen and Bahrain and Syria and elsewhere. But since they went to an arms struggle um, a week or so later, uh, some of the people who've risen to the top of them Thank you. A little sketch here. Uh, they have included some radical Islamists. Have included uh, some people who were high officials in the Gaddafi regime until just a few weeks ago. And what particularly concerns me is that uh, history has shown that when a dictator is overthrown through, through massive nonviolent action, 95% of the time there's a, a transition to democracy. But when a dictator is overthrown through armed struggle, more often than not, it's simply replaced by another dictatorship. 
Right, right. Now, uh, if we compare that to the origin of all these struggles, let's start with Tunisia. In, in your opinion, also, there is speculation that while this is the Facebook generation, that what started this struggle in Tunisia? And we could probably go from there to Egypt. I mean, the trigger then, of course, was the um, suicide of the um, uh, unemployed college graduate uh, who had been harassed by police for setting up a, a, a fruit stand. But in many ways, it was emblematic of the growing discontent uh, with the growing economic inequality and the social injustice and the and the, and the corruption and authoritarianism of the uh, Ben Ali regime, uh, and, and this is a concern that's you know really spreading. Uh, that that of course is is, is common uh, throughout that part of the world. In certain ways, uh, what we've seen in Tunisia and Egypt uh, successfully and and in progress in a number of other places is what we've seen in countries. Over the past few decades, ranging from the Philippines to Poland, from Chile to Serbia, it's just this uh, universal uh, desire for for freedom and justice, and a realization that um, you know grassroots movement uh, using strategic nonviolent action and other forms of un unarmed uh, resistance uh, can be effective in, in bringing down even the most tyrannical of regimes. Now, if 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 this injustice was known throughout the West that these are dictatorships. Ships. Why wasn't there any action or any calls, a la Bush? You know, a la Bush, who who was talking about the democratization and all. Was that just a, a very much a, a empty talk? By well, Bush? Yeah, Bush talked, well, Bush talked about spreading democracy from Damascus to Tehran, and while I think everyone would agree that Syria and Iran could use more democracy, he didn't talk about spreading uh, democracy from Tunis to Cairo or to. Mm -hmm. Riyadh or Manama or Muscat or Sana'a or, or right. any of the other U.S.-backed dictatorships in the area. He basically used uh, democracy as an excuse for going after authoritarian regimes uh, we didn't like while redoubling support for authoritarian regimes we did like. So uh, the, 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 uh, the, the democracy promotion stuff by Bush was pretty phony. In fact, it set back the democracy movements in many ways because uh, – uh, these various uh, dictators could claim that any pro-democracy movement was therefore advancing U.S. imperialism, et cetera, et cetera. That's the line the Iranians and others have used. And, and, and not to mention the, uh, I mean, the fact that he basically, because it was an excuse for uh, aggression and invasion and and uh, and, and the like in, in Iraq, uh, he essentially did to democracy what uh, Stalin did to socialism in terms of uh, giving it a bad name. And making it synonymous with uh, you know foreign uh, foreign occupation, so um, the uh, but but this is the real thing, and we found that in, in the past uh, you know twenty thirty years, virtually no countries become democratic through foreign invasion, and the vast majority have become democratic through just these kinds of uh, popular um, grassroots unarmed insurrections. Well, certainly Iraq didn't look good, and perhaps uh, might look a little bit embarrassing to the U.S in light of the nonviolent uprising that took place in Tunisia and, and Egypt so far? Very much so. I mean, I think this, um, you know, n not only, uh, you know, countered al-Qaeda's thesis, that only through right. their version of, uh, of, 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 of jihad, of, uh, of their, you know, uh, uh, Islamic extremism, terrorism is the only way to fight U.S.-backed dictatorships. It, it uh, equally challenged the whole neocon notion that only through U.S. intervention uh, can uh, democracy come, and and uh, that's that's another reason I'm concerned about this whole Libya thing, and and, and that is uh, we really uh, though um, overthrowing Gaddafi is, is uh, by the, due to the nature of the regime and that society is going to be more challenging than in a lot of parts of the, of the world. That uh, nonviolent revolutions really have a better track record uh, in terms of uh, challenging uh, dictatorships. Right. Well, when it comes to that, going back to the uh, to to Egypt. Uh, uh, what did this do to the Al-Qaeda or, or to the idea that Al-Qaeda, that up to now, uh, knock on wood as they say, or, or uh, that nobody has blown themselves up? If actually, if Al-Qaeda were to be true, then somebody might have done it already, wouldn't it? Mm -hmm. You know, you know they're, they're, uh, this is Al Qaeda's worst nightmare. I mean, they were uh, that uh, you know that people would say, hey, there's an alternative to. Um, um, yeah. Both the Al Qaeda way and the uh, and the Western imperialist, uh, you know, or, or pro-Western dictator kind of kind of way, 
that uh, this is a popular empowerment. Al Qaeda hasn't come close to overthrowing uh, an, an Arab dictatorship, but uh, you know the, these nonviolent movements uh, have, have um, overthrown the largest and most important Arab country, Egypt. Uh, they, they, they toppled the dictatorship in Tunisia, and they are ser- seriously threatening the dictatorship in, in Yemen, and are ongoing serious challenges in, in Bahrain and Syria and elsewhere. 